Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Kaiser. Just a quick question. Is there anybody here who is here for the first time at a Metals Investor Forum conference? Oh, uh, you don't count, Glenn. Congratulations on sticking around for the new decade after struggling through the lost decade that we have had since 2011. So the question is, is it really going to be the roaring 20s for the resource juniors? Are we at the cusp of a turnaround? Or is this just the usual January effect and we're all hoping, engaging in wishful thinking, and that before long this will fade away again? So here's my favorite uh, slide, which tracks the non-resource and resource value traded and the per relative percent on the TSX Venture Exchange. This was the last time we really had fun. Uh, this is where all the marijuana and crypto guys had fun. We're seeing a possible switch over where the uh, uh, cannabis and the uh, crypto and all that is fading away possibly down for the count, and the resource sector seems to be coming alive. But that's a bit of an illusion because this is still relatively small traded value. And one of the companies in the last uh, week uh, that's on the podium here traded maybe 15, 20% of that value uh, on that day. So it was still a long way for seeing this sort of increase validated. Now, the cannabis bubble sucked a lot of oxygen out of the resource junior room because it was a winner-take-all dynamic similar to the dot-com bubble and uh, uh, it captured a younger generation of people who were familiar with uh, what uh, cannabis was. They understood the product. It was a momentum type trade. But now we've reached a point where there's 400 tons in Canadian warehouses um, waiting to be consumed. That's one billion joints. The Canadians need to step up and take one for the Bay Street Cannabis team to bring down that stockpile. Ah, but the story is America's next. Well, I live in California, and you get to grow six plants on your private residence. Do you have any idea how big a plant can get in California? That's not a chihuahua. That's probably a thousand joints. And have you heard of the sharing economy? You're not allowed to sell this if you grow it for your private consumption, but who wants to smoke a thousand joints in one year? So in terms of the upside, the growth market in that, uh, the profitable one by the public companies, it'll be there, but it's not this endlessly expanding thing. As for crypto, Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. That's all it really is. It, it nourishes itself on a pool of greater fools and had to run to 20,000, backed off. It may have another run, but it's pretty much finished. And it's intriguing to see that crypto miners are even more adept at losing money than metal miners. And they don't even produce anything like jobs for a metal, as metal miners do, nor is there a product that actually makes the world better that results from it. So I think that's uh, also uh, over and not going to steal risk capital away from our sector. Now here's the problem of uh, resource financing. The red is the uh, amount done per month by TSX Venture resource listings. And uh, it's not as bad as that horror period between 2013 and 15, but it is still nothing like we had in 2010 and 11. And, uh, and this is a big question. Where is the pool of capital going to come from? Oops. Did I skip one? Okay, no, no, this is it. Yeah, everybody who is a boomer is now 55 or older. That means resource juniors are unsuitable for them. And unfortunately, most of the accredited investors are also boomers. The post-boomers, which is anybody born after 1965, that's actually a lost set of generations which does not know about this space. Uh, they know about momentum trading, they know about the idea of how much fun it is to make a big buck, but the other thing that people don't really talk about much is how 
there is an end times mentality pervading society. And you see this in the behavior of the millennials, uh, their reluctance to uh, engage in family formation, their emphasis on experience, not even accumulating things or anything like that. And that's why you know, the, the cannabis, which they understood and which was able to make a quick buck, uh, uh, how can you blame them when facing all this uncertainty that they went into that sort of thing? Now, I think the resource sector really is Betting on that is trying to be an optimist, except for gold, which is uh, more for pessimists. But the big problem I see out there is all these younger generations aren't really allowed to invest in resource juniors. Um, as I mentioned, you have to be worth a, a, a million dollars, not including your primary residence. Most post-boomers are not worth that. Uh, there aren't the very few public financings done anymore. Uh, not like the old days in the 80s uh, where you did the SMF financings and you could do three, five thousand dollars worth. But they did introduce an existing security holder exemption, which is a great start. Fifteen thousand bucks per year per company. Any Canadian resident can do that. Except there's a hitch. They say you have to own at least one share uh, on the day that uh, it's announced which means that some company announces a PP, like say Tri Origin, and people say, wow, this is cheap, this is great, I'd love to do it. Sorry, you don't own shares from before. Why this requirement? Well, the reason is the regulators have no confidence in their existing regulatory system. If a company puts out an announcement of a PP, you're supposed to be able to go to CDAR and look up all the filings and all the news releases and go to the website and know as much as there is to know about the company. Instead, they want you to already have engaged with the company to be qualified to participate in the financing. That's BS. And plus, simplification. That document for this little company, 44 pages, only six are necessary. The whole system is designed to discourage participation by private individuals in these sorts of financings. And the leverage is in these private placements, especially when there are warrants attached. So I'm on a rampage now to get this changed because we need to get the post-boomers money into this market in small segments, uh, increments, into the treasuries, not just into the pockets of insiders and the millionaires out there. I'm not going to dwell on this slide very much. It's such a depressing slide. I've talked about it uh, in past conferences. But there are so many things that are going wrong in the world, and it's creating a climate of rising uncertainty. And that increased uh, this, this in January when they took out Kasim Suleiman and uh, ratcheted up the tensions in the Middle East. This idea of uncertainty, it's really, really important to uh, understanding why we are at the beginning of another bull market. And for me, the question is, is gold ready to reprice into the $2,000 to $3,000 range? And you might say, OK, Kaiser's joined the uh, fiat currency, the basement lunatic fringe, and uh, he's talking crazy numbers. Uh, what's going on here? Well, it actually has happened in the past. And if you, gold's supposed to be a safe haven, and all the gold in the world, its value can be measured relative to other asset classes. If you measure it relative to global GDP and plot it, in 1980, all the gold stock that existed at the time at 850 was worth 25% of GDP. And uh, in 2000, it had sunk to 3.5%. During that recent run-up in 2011, it got to 14%, and now it's sort of bumbling around 11%. What if that percent can be treated as a measure of the degree of uncertainty perceived by the world? And as you can see, we're now sort of less than halfway of the extreme that we experienced in 1980. So what was going on back then? The 70s was a repricing. Part of it was adjusting for accumulated inflation. But the other part was about the uncertainty about America's role in the world. And uh, you know, we had Af the Afghanistan invasion. We had the Iran uh, revolution, the hostage taking. We had OPEC putting the boots to America. Um, America looked like it was losing it. But as we now know, they didn't. They fixed it 
and it changed. But gold stabilized at $400 and basically ushered in a bull market for gold mining and exploration, not for gold speculators, but for the resource sector industry. And um, if you take that $400 gold and inflation adjusted to present, it's $12.77. So that big run from 2002 to, to 1900 and then back to uh, where it is now, that was mainly an inflation catch up. But now in the last four years, uncertainty about the future has gone through the roof. And I'm arguing that we're in a spot very similar to this, not this, but this, an uncertainty move. And what if we reach that same measure of 25% this year in terms of uh, uncertainty or percent that the six billion ounces are relative to global GDP? And there's where I get the magic number. This is equivalent to this back then. So that is why I'm a crazy person saying, we are going to see gold go through 2,000, maybe shoot to 3,000, and then settle in there somewhere along the way, and not because there's massive inflation in the system, but just because more and more capital is going to seek a safe haven in gold itself. And it's all linked to this idea of uncertainty. And if you're looking at the, like the downside, I mean, $500 gold is the equivalent of the peace and harmony period of 2000, when America was the undisputed leader of not just the free world, the entire world. So one of my goals is to attract post-boomers into this sector, because without them becoming part of it, uh, um, you know, the sector dies. There just isn't enough capital. I mean, those of us who are boomers or, or even the greatest generation ever, we're sitting on $21 trillion worth of real estate that we're supposed to unload on the younger generation sometime in the next uh, 20 years. And they're not really accumulating capital or anything because they figure we are rigging the entire world so that when the lights go out for us, sunsets for us, it lights out for everybody else. This is the negative psychology we can use to attract the younger generation with this concept of uncertainty. And with this uncertainty and pessimism about the future, you want to make a lot of money quickly. So that makes them very similar to all of us boomers, boomers and older. But in another way, they also want to be optimistic about the future. So instead of just giving them five, 10, 100 bagger juniors, uh, we also need to give them stories that appeal to their longer sense of what's good for the world. Now, my favorite gold stock is Midas Gold. They've been plodding along in the uh, um, you know, permitting cycle in Idaho forever. And, uh, and, and they made file their environmental impact statement this year and uh, tell us, uh, publish the feasibility study. And so we'll see what this project is going to be worth at different prices. I think the numbers are going to wash out to something similar. And what this here is, is sort of showing what's the value between 5 and 10% uh, discount rates at the different price points. Here's the base case. Here's where it is now. It's potentially in the money, but uh, not close. Uh, but this is the sort of range that if you believe that, uh, that stock should be trading at. But it's here. So there's a pessimism in the system about Midas Gold and its 300,000 ounce potential to uh, uh, produce once they get uh, permitted and uh, build this thing. And you can see what a dog it's been in the last uh, five, six years. So I would tell every young person to buy some of this because when gold does this uncertainty-based move, this stock's going to go up five, ten times in price. But this one's also a good candidate for the post-boomer club. Nobody really needs more gold in the world, but you put this thing into production and you accomplish two important things. You reclaim what should be called a Superfund disaster site. This place was used to mine antimony during World War II and then later gold, and it was trashed. It's a disaster area. This is a gold mine that's a really a reclamation project funded by a gold mine. So if you're going to be a post-boomer and you're thinking about you know, the, a positive future and stuff, there is an extra reason to make a lot of money on this one. 
But even more importantly, antimony is going to be a byproduct. Where does it all come from? China right now. Are China and America ever going to be happy partners again? I'm not sure. But if you get this thing in production, America will have its domestic antimony needs taken care of as a byproduct. So if you're an American resident, or even a Canadian one, because they'll ship it north to us, there's another long-term positive reason to own this. Now, the big thing that I've been complaining about is that the investing public doesn't understand how to price these juniors. And in that foregoing slide, that was your standard discounted cash flow model with all the numbers of pulled from economic studies all pulled in. But when it's earlier, before there's an economic study on the table, you still want to price how what the upside is, what is the size of the price. And that's a big revolution that's coming, and I'm part of the process to teach everybody how to do that. Now, in early 2016, I nailed Arizona Mining, and it's a, a Hermosa Taylor project, a dead on, it was 35, 50 cents. I said, this is an emerging discovery, and I used the rational speculation model to justify and explain the pricing. And then there's this joyful thing called an S-curve, which means when it starts, when you have a discovery, this is the fair value taking it all the way to what it's going to be worth at the end of the day, but the market loves to do this. And we're not ready to really bet on optionality plays yet, but we've got the appetite for discovery plays. And as we go from glass half empty to glass half full, a lot of the real juniors, or all the real juniors, are going to suddenly find it much easier to attract audiences, and they'll have to explain what the upside is for their story. And this is a very fun time. I believe that this turnaround is probably for real. And the next six months is the window during which the most money will be made in this next cycle that's coming. So I'm going to talk about the five companies that are here. One, all of them are five to 10 bagger potentials just as this adjustment, except for one, they already delivered a three bagger earlier this week, so there's, we're gonna have to wait a while before we get another five, 10 baggers from these levels. But Zephyr Minerals, um, they are a little gold company, fairly valued for their little small uh, project in Colorado. So you buy this just for this, and if gold price keeps going up and they're able to develop this, you're going to see this wander up about five, seven times in price. So now I'm going to explain how you need to think about these juniors. This junior, you basically are buying this gold thing, unless you know about the El Plomo project, which uh, Lauren's going to tell us about later. That's a broken hill zinc type play at the target testing stage. And this is what they're shooting for. If they find something like a Cannington, it's this channel which is fair value. The market right now is saying, we don't believe it. But if it starts to believe it, we have a double or triple just to achieve fair value for the bet on the $2 billion outcome. And is a Cannington, if you find a Cannington today, is it worth $2 billion? You bet it is. And you, you can see from the stock chart, this one is my potential next Arizona mining, and it only has about 60 million shares, probably 70 million when they finance uh, this program, compared to 340 million for Arizona mining. So if they start delivering, delivering something like Hermosa Taylor, watch out. It's not going to be a $6.20 buyout three years after I picked it at 35 cents. It's going to be a much bigger buyout. But you get that for free right now because it still has that plan B. Now, Tiger Gold is a spin-out of Eagle Plains, which is a current favorite of mine. Tiger Gold, I've got spec value, bottom fish spec value rated. And um, what you have here is a deal. SSR has spent eight million bucks on a project that's grassroots, that they hope to generate several million ounces of medium grade plus uh, gold to feed their their CB Santoy complex to the north, and uh, they'll probably vest for 80% 80 80 by the end of this year. So here's a story where you have a $34 million valuation assigned by the market, and what's that project going to be worth? It's going to be worth somewhere between 
100 and 500 million dollars if it's what, what SSR thinks is there is delivered. So you maybe get a, a, three, a three to 10 bagger out of that. But while they're waiting, they also have 100% owned projects also at the target ready stage, except they don't have the capital. So if we are moving into a market where money is suddenly coming in looking for drill ready plays, these guys can get a higher valuation just as a result. I mean, they're eight, 10 cents right now raise some money and start testing these own targets. And if they start delivering something like uh, what the uh, SSR has at uh, Fisher, well, th then you have a quadruple just, uh, just by going to uh, that sort of valuation. So again, you get kind of a hedged scenario with companies like that. And the idea of the bigger backdrop changing from three quarters empty to half full that's a key part. If you believe that, you need to look at companies like this very seriously. Now, understand the big and little picture dynamics of juniors. Um, some of the more advanced companies, which aren't discovery exploration plays, like FPX Nickel, you need to understand the big picture as well as the little picture. The big picture for Nickel is what is the price going to be. Right now it's six and a quarter, and it may uh, rise to, uh, you know, maybe six fifty, seven dollars. Uh, will it go back to nine dollars? Well, this company had a PEA based on twenty-two million bucks by Cliffs, saying, well, this thing's great, but it requires nine dollars or better. So the market right now is pricing it at twenty-five million for a hundred million dollar outcome, except the project will have a two billion dollar capex. So this is the same as saying, you know, it's not worth anything. If it ends up having a uh, $2 billion capex, it's gonna end up being having an NPV somewhere in here. So this is an example of where the company has done things since reacquiring the project to change the fundamentals. And we're gonna hear later about what has been done to suddenly make this thing possibly in the money in the six to seven dollar range. And so after this lost decade, these valuations are so negatively skewed, you can look at this and it's clear what bets you are making. Here you make a little picture bet that they have changed the fundamentals and a big picture bet that nickel's gonna stabilize in the seven to eight dollar range. And that, by the way, is also a post-boomer stock beyond making 10 bagger or more. That project has the potential to be carbon neutral and it also has the potential to make nickel sulfate directly from the concentrate that they produce at that project. So you get your dual reason for picking that one rather than some nickel sulfide play. Niobe Metals, this company is still reflecting a valuation of uh, having to overcome a social license issue. And Niobium is a market nobody understands. It's a $3 billion plus market. It's controlled mainly by one company, and there is lots of room for littler companies with a lower grade to come into this thing. So this company will be doing a PEA by the end of this year now that they can gather the additional information needed to make this happen. And again, it's a number crunching exercise, and I've done some back the envelope already, and I can see that the market is not taking this seriously. This is another five to 10 bagger during the awakening this year. And because niobium makes steel lighter, which they call a light weighting, it means that anything that moves that has niobium in it consumes less energy. So for those consumed, worried about uh, you know, uh, energy consumption, this is a no brainer. But it's a no brainer also for those who don't care about climate change and all that because it makes uh, uh, less energy consumption. So this one's also a, qualifies for the post-boomer club. And then the last one, Azimut Exploration. As you can see, this company I followed for, for ages. I mean, this, this chart goes back, uh, whatever, 20 years, and current management came in around here, had that big run during the last decade, but has been tracking sideways. Now you see this huge spike. And uh, that spike is what you call the beginning of the S-curve. $91 million valuation for their 100% owned Elmer project. And you say, well, that implies a $2 billion outcome. Well, that's not really there yet. But 
what we have is the S-curve, which will push something way up here at this discovery delineation stage. Until all the numbers are in, everybody is free to dream all over the map. And as we enter a market where its discoveries start to happen, where a case can be made, wow, you do this drilling and that drilling and all that and put it together, there's like a you know, three to five million ounce potential, or if you take it deep enough, maybe 10 million ounce. And having something like my rational speculation model to quantify all that and see it, then you create liquidity in the market as the different uh, contingents out there place bets for or against or for different scenarios. And that also is the foundation for having fun. Because in a casino, you don't go there to make money or just go there to make money. You go there to have fun. And what's gone been wrong with the junior resource sector is uh, not only have we not made much money at all, but we haven't had any fun. And we're heading into a period where it's going to be fun. This project has the potential to flip the glass half full, at least for Quebec. Now the reaction tripling from say a $30 million valuation to $90 million, that caught me by surprise. And while the project's fantastic, uh, got lots of potential, this type of reaction also tells me that the audience out there is primed to take a turnaround seriously. And last year we had gold go from whatever, 1300 to 1550, and it did nothing for the juniors because people didn't believe it had any staying power. Now we have two trends happening. On Friday, 621,000 ounces was pulled into the uh, GLD ETF after you know, losing 400,000 when it retreated from 1600 during the Solomania assassination. And uh, at the same time, we're seeing new discoveries from grunt work emerge. We are at a special turning point. Will this time be different? A lot like uh, 2016, where we thought that was two, and by August it was all over. And here's the sentiment cycle. Uh, you know, this was my favorite uh, uh, last year. The best it did was just under 10%, and the worst it did was minus 23% and closed down 14.5%. The new batch, which is about two thirds of the old ones plus a bunch of new ones, is already up 16%. But this sentiment cycle, this is important. You know, are we here emerging from depression? And this, you know, this is something I actually thought of last year, and I started taking steps. Um, in fact, this past week, I took an important step. In 1996, I moved from a home office to an external office, just in time for BREEX and a five-year dot-com-related bear market. <laughs> in early 2008, I moved from that office to a nicer office in a different building, just in time for the financial crisis. Now, we had that turnaround in 2009 to 2011, so I said, well, let's move into a bigger office in that same building, which I did, and ushered in an eight-year bear market. So this past week, I downgraded to the, uh, to the uh, uh, smaller office in that same building. So I may be the perfect contrarian indicator. And if that's not all, I'm doing a web design web redesign right now because mine's over 15 years old and creaky and loads and slowly and all that. So I decide I'm going to shut down new registrations for new members so they don't get confused by the old site. Well, how about that for good timing? If this continues, what I think is happening, when will I ever get the new website done? So exist former subscribers can uh, you know, still get in there and, uh, and, 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 and re-enroll for it at the older price. Uh, but I'm now unrestricting stuff uh, after a certain period. So for those of you who have never been subscribers, uh, uh, you can watch uh, from uh, follow me on Twitter and see the stuff. And this is going to be a slowly evolving market. You're going to make a lot of money just paying attention right now. Thank you. <laughs>